Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this week's episode of the Visual Studio Remote Office Hours. Um, my name is Matt Christensen, and I am uh, delighted that you are joining us here today because we have an exciting show for you. We're going to talk about machine learning and artificial intelligence, intelligence rather, inside Visual Studio, because we actually have some inside Visual Studio. And, and what does it do? Uh, how does it help us? And um, what will it do for us in the future? These are all uh, great questions that we're going to look into. Now, I will give you a little update on uh, my home office because I kind of do that every time. And here's my latest uh, little gadget that I uh, bought. This is a USB speaker. You can see there's a cable here that is just uh, up on my pegboard here on the uh, my workbench. So if you go, there's a picture of what it looks like today this morning. So if you go check out my Twitter, you can see what that looks like. But this is basically like a $10 USB speaker, and it's a hell of a lot better sound, let me tell you, than um, than sort of a laptop. Um, so that's awesome. So I'm going to put that back up there. Uh, slowly getting into a more uh, professional state here in my uh, very unprofessional home office. So with that out of the way, let's say hello to our two guests. And so, Katie, why don't you start by introducing yourselves? Hi. Um, my name is Katie, um, and I am one of the program managers for Visual Studio and Telecode. I'm looking forward to this conversation today. Awesome. And Mark? Hey, yeah. Uh, hi, Mads. Uh, you and I have worked together for a long time. I'm a, a program manager. Uh, I've been a program manager on Visual Studio for like 12 years, something like that now. I don't know. I'm getting too old. Um, and uh, now I'm uh, w uh, working with Katie uh, as a program manager on the IntelliCo team. I've uh, been at this for like two and a bit years now and uh, thoroughly enjoying it. So looking forward to chatting with all the folks about uh, what we can do with AI. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, I think, Mark, I think the first time uh, I met you, you were the program manager for the Visual Studio editor. So just the editor itself that dealt with, you know, uh, syntax highlighting and IntelliSense and all that sort of stuff. So this is this is quite some years ago, I guess. So for the people that are online, please remember that you have on your right side of the screen, you have a Q&A panel. So that means that you can ask us any question you like, um, anything for Mark and Katie about machine learning and AI inside Visual Studio. But you can ask any question about Visual Studio. And, you know, with three people here that works on the Visual Studio team, there's a good chance that we're able to answer that. So just keep the questions coming and we'll answer them as we go along. Okay, let's get into it. Um, so, Mark, I know that you're on the, uh, you're, well, you're both on the IntelliCode team. And um, I've heard a lot about IntelliCode. I think I know what it is. But every time we talk, I learn that it is more than I think it is. <laughs> it's hap it happens every single time. Like it's expanded. The, the the role of the machine learning is is doing something I didn't even know that it used to do and stuff like that. So things are moving quick, it seems like. But what is IntelliCo? Can you kind of give a, an overview of what it is and how we use the machine learning and AI? Uh, yeah. For IntelliCo. Glad to do it, Mads. I, I mean, you know, I've been at this, I say, I was looking back a bit yesterday and uh, realizing that I've been playing this game now for uh, two, two and a bit years uh, working on IntelliCode. And we, we first previewed some stuff way back in 2018 at Build. Um, but we've, we've really kept the same focus all the way along, right? Um, so from the start, we were looking at ways that we could use the power of the machine to um, delve into um, your code as data and the things wrapped around your code as data and present back to you based on the kind of wisdom that it harvested and distilled down um, some useful insights, right? Um, some useful insights that can actually help you to uh, do your job um, in, in a more effective fashion. And so when we talk to customers, when we talk to developers, we found that um, you know, there were various areas where there were struggles in their, uh, you know, their development life. And they, for instance, you know, they might say, well, I'm, I'm coming at an unfamiliar API. I really don't quite understand how to how to use that API, but I could really use some assistance. Or actually, and, I, and this is a conversation we've been having more recently, um, I'm re-familiarizing myself with an API. I, I don't quite know what to do. Um, you know, um, I, I'm really trying to get myself back up to speed again uh, whilst using this thing, and I want to be effective. Um, and so 
so that got us into thinking about how can we do better in terms of not just um, the completion list, but other places too, in terms of presenting the right stuff to you. So helping you cope with confidence, right? Uh, so that you can actually get right into something and the machine can help you out by presenting the things that are your most likely pattern choices, right? So the power of pattern is really a big theme across the whole of IntelliCode, right? That machines can do stuff now, can delve into patterns that they were simply not able to do a few years ago, okay? And all of our code and all of our things around code, what I kind of call code metadata, all of that stuff is like a substrate. There's a big scientific word for you, but you know, just a, a, a place where things can grow, or where we can grow that insight and uh, and, and bring it back to you, right? Um, so we, that's that's really the, the the founding insight was that that we believe that that machines can grab grab those insights and bring them to you at your point of need, and then we talk about you know how that can help you out when you're trying to find issues. So think about anti patterns. Think about things where you your your team has done a great deal of work perhaps to uh, to go ahead and fix some problem that's actually a common anti pattern that keeps coming up in every single flipping code review and it drives you nuts. Um, and what about if the machine could spot those patterns and put those fixes out there for you so that you didn't have to keep reminding everyone in every single code review? Um, that'd be neat, wouldn't it? And so we talk about that as being kind of how we can help you find issues faster. Uh, and then we talk about focusing your reviews. So you heard a little bit just there about how issue code reviews can become messed up with a whole bunch of repetitive tedium. We were looking at ways that we can relieve that pain as well. But all of this, it, it comes down to the capacity of machines to learn huge things across giant substrates that would be really hard for a human to learn and bring those useful insights back to you right where you need them. That kind of makes sense. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's really helpful. So, you know, it reminds me like 10 years ago when I first started on working on Visual Studio at Microsoft, I had this whiteboard in my office and at the very top I had written in big letters the thinking IDE and the, the, the idea was that an IDE should be sort of anticipating your next move and make that as seamless as possible and it was sort of a pipe dream right it was more like a vision or more like a north star to shoot for but what you're talking about is seems like that it seems like a way that we don't have to deal with the sort of the trivialities or the mundane things of programming. We can go straight to solving the problem that we were hired to do and uh, exactly. don't have to worry about like, I guess, like formatting and, and other such things in, in a code review that seems trivial. Right, exactly so. And, and it doesn't have to be restricted to the trivial either. That's the thing. So, you know, these can be reasonably complicated things. I mean, we've got some stuff to show you later that, that I think you'll find fun uh, that will help you find actually quite complicated things uh, and repeated patterns that, you know, you, you maybe wouldn't even have had time to spot and might have bitten you on the um, posterior later on. And, uh, you know, that's that's something we, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, we, we let the machine loose on that kind of stuff as well. So it's not so much just the the mundane um, and the repetitive, but it's also the stuff that is too big for you to wrap your head around because you just don't have time, right? Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that, you know, maybe a bit later when we talk about suggestions. All right. So that makes good sense. So it's 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 both the mundane and the complex. Um, so <clears throat> when when um, IntelliCode first was introduced, it was it was doing something in my IntelliSense. It was augmenting the IntelliSense. And in the beginning, I didn't really know what to make of it. Like I, I it was, you know, my cheese got moved, something changed. The IntelliSense had looked a certain way for like maybe two decades or something like that. Now all of a sudden it was different. So what happened there and how how did how did that solve problem? Like how do how do I guess I, I my big question is how and why? Did you do to intelligence what you did and can you explain what it was that you did katie uh sure um i don't know if you're still hearing me okay cool um so yeah so uh what what we did was we actually uh learned and trained on open source repos um, and we learned just like the common usage of uh, various classes um, and what you're seeing um sort of as you see those sort of autocomplete pop-ups is you're seeing sort of what it what are those like top used or most used or commonly used uh types or or functions or methods um, for that class um, so it really allows and enables uh developers um, who um, may not be 
quite familiar or, or might just forget or not recall um, what is the right function or the right method to use in a certain circumstance. It allows you to sort of provide provides you with sort of contextual um, um, uh, method recall um, as you're typing. Um, so this is very, very helpful for um, a number of scenarios. So imagine if you're a developer who's just onboarding um, to a particular class or namespace, this really just sort of gets you, um, sort of helps you sort of assist you as you're, as you're typing. Um, it's also super valuable for even this more seasoned developer um, who might have not used a particular class in a long time or might just be, um, you know, not super familiar with like an internal library, for instance, with one of our other features team completions um, and sort of gets you sort of set um, without having to navigate to the web or have to navigate to Stack Overflow. Um, you just have everything at your fingertips. OK, so <clears throat> that's really cool. Uh, the uh, the uh, it seems like being able to figure out how to use something based on how other people use it mm -hmm. is pretty much what we do when we go and Google something, right? And or we go to Stack Overflow to find out like how do I use, you know, this method and this class from this library that I just installed. Um, but now that's just that's just right there in my IntelliSense list. And that's and that's all coming. Is that all from GitHub or is there any other uh, sources to that? And how do how do and how do you determine what sources to choose from? Katie? So we determined which sources to use. Um, so the, right now, our, um, our, our, our base completions model, which you're seeing you know, as you start typing in Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code, um, that is based off of um, open, top open source repos. And so those are the repos that hope have over 100 stars. Um, so we've, we've done a couple of things. So we've trained our completions model based off of um, this learning of these open source repos. So like seeing these top repos and just learning from those. Um, but we've also sort of curated that learning. So we've we've actually it's, it's a supervised learning model where we're we're actually like um, um, saying which ones are the top even within those top repos. What, what are the top most used um, uh, types or classes within those uh, repos to ensure that you're getting um, the contextual usage, not just sort of like um, uh, the, the methods or properties that are used um, just broadly, you're getting sort of like a more intelligent or more catered um, sort of experience or tailored experience. Um, uh, so I guess um, to answer your question, Mads, um, this is uh, uh, what we're providing for the user is not just sort of a comprehensive sort of dictionary of methods, but sort of providing them with uh, the right methods, the right properties to use at the right moment and when they need it. Um, so we don't want to provide you everything. We sort of want to just provide you what we believe you'll actually, um, what will be useful in order to enable you to uh, be productive at the moment when you're trying to use it. Okay, that makes sense. So, I don't know. Maybe it was like a year ago. I came to uh, I came to you, Mark, and I said, "Hey, you know, Visual Studio extensibility is a kind of a complex set of APIs. So, if you've ever tried to re uh, write a Visual Studio extension, you know that uh, all the APIs there are maybe not so well documented, and it can be hard to find out um, exactly how to use them. So, I went to Mark and I said, "Hey, can we?" Can we index a bunch of sample repositories on GitHub and, and other apps that use these so that we can give better IntelliSense using those machine learning models for all these APIs in the business <laughs> extensibility space? And uh, and Mark was so so kind to say, of course. And you know what did it take? Two weeks or whatever, and boom, it was there in the product, and everyone benefited. And we actually made it so that IntelliCode was now a optional but a recommended uh, component when you install the workload for Visual Studio extensibility. So I think that was an example where we took, we saw there was a, a niche problem. Granted, it's a niche. It's not the biggest space in the world, right? Visual Studio extensions. But we were able to like tailor and optimize the, um, the machine learning for that. So Mark, 
is that possible if people run their own NuGet packages, they have uh, some users of those NuGet packages, can they also ask that you index to improve their users' um, experience for uh, their APIs? Is that a thing? Well, there's a couple of answers to that question, uh, Mads. And, uh, you know, I, I want to um, uh, sort of start from the top. Um, one of the first things we kind of heard from people when uh, when they started to use these uh, that these new starred IntelliSense suggestions was exactly what you've said. It's like, hey, you know, I use this library or that library, right? Um, but uh, it's not super common, right? Just exactly like what you were talking about with VS extensibility. Not, you know, it might not reach the bar of being in enough of the open source GitHub repos for us to pick it up and include it in what Katie was referring to as our base models, right? So uh, how can we solve that problem? And, and for some libraries, absolutely where there's uh, there's usage out there, uh, we're happy to hear from people and uh, ask, asking us to put certain library sets into our base models. And that can be a very effective thing for us to do if we know where there's great samples to be had, right? So we can train on it pretty much any GitHub repo if it's open. Um, and, and so if we know it's important, you can point us at it and we can go at it and uh, do exactly what we did for the VS extensibility space. But I think um, I'd want to ask Katie to talk to us a little bit about um, some of the, the, the things that um, uh, are going on for cases where it might not be uh, something that's for everybody, but where it's more about your own internal code bases and you've got internal classes and stuff like that, right? So that's the other problem that comes up, right? Once people get hooked on this stuff, right? And what, we, what we've heard from people is that they, they kind of like uh, getting these stars, but they were upset that they weren't getting them for other classes they were commonly using. Sometimes those other common classes are actually um, in your own code. And, and Katie, I don't know, do you want to... Um, uh, have a, have, a, have a bit of chat about what we're doing for that. Mm. Sure, Mark. Uh, yeah, so um, so what Mark is referring to is a feature that we call team completions. And so as Mark was mentioning, um, you can currently get IntelliCode star completion suggestions um, for like from the base model just as you're typing. So it's sort of predicting what you're going to say, what, what's next, but that's based off of common usage. And that common usage, as Mads and I were talking about earlier, is based off of training on open source repos or the top open source repos. But what if you're working in an internal library or um, you're working on code or type or, or for types that aren't commonly found in open source repos. Um, so what do you do? And so for us, we have now enabled team completions. And team completions, um, it not only like augments that sort of base completions model that Mark was referring to uh, with your custom types, um, but it automatically also shares that with everyone who has access to your code base. Um, so, so that is the super cool part of like, let's say that you're working on um, in a Git repo and I want to um, train a, a, a team completions model so I, can, so I can get those starred completions for my own types. Well, once you do that training, um, you've also shared that with the, with the rest of your team automatically. Anyone who has access to that Git repository automatically gets all of those the starred completions for those unique types, um, which I think is is super super cool. Um, so um, uh, yeah, I think that combined with the context of your code, you can just imagine as as you're typing and as you're developing, you're starting to um, not just code faster, but you're also just sort of being assisted along the way. So you can sort of stay in that developer flow um, with having these starred completions. Okay, so if I have an open source library, for instance, or a NuGet package that people are using, uh, can I then do this uh, team completions for my own uh, for my own set of APIs or whatever that I've developed, and then whoever has access to my GitHub repository will also get the benefit of those completions? Is that is that what I hear? Katie? <laughs> so it's somewhat like that. So if it's a Git repository, let's be very like, it, it, we'll be specific. So for right now, we've enabled this for just Git repositories. Um, 
And so if it's on GitHub or if it's an Azure DevOps and it's a it's a Git based repository, then yes, you can have a manual training um, and then that would once that that manual training that um, team completions model will be attached to that repository and shared with the rest of your team. However, there was a part that you talked about a NuGet package. And that's something that we have on our backlog and we've been thinking actually very recently about, um, but we have not enabled um, attaching um, uh, team completions models to NuGet packages yet. Or, or those or those libraries. So we do have that in our mind that we um, as a top scenario of enabling library owners um, to be able to train a team completions model and then distribute that um, with to the rest of their you know library users um, and also vice versa. We also have the the the, the idea that we we'd love for a library user to be able to train for a NuGet package and then you know with the consent of the NuGet package owner um, of course be able to distribute. Um, so we are actually planning on lighting that up. Um, but for right now team completions is just scoped to um, get repositories and um, I don't know. I think that Mark might actually have something to add here. Yeah. Um, so I mean, Katie's really put it pretty well there. Um, the, the the game is a little bit different. So because at the moment, Mads, you could come to my office, uh, or someone could send me an email, right? Um, or send Katie an email and say, "Hey, I really, really want my package to be included, or my set of packages to be included." Those can get included today in the our, in our base model. So we have a way to do that for uh, for uh, things that we think are important. But obviously, that's kind of not going to scale to the num the sheer number and variety. Of packages that are out there, and uh, so as a package author, as you were saying, you know, you you can't really, I, we can't have every package author be banging on our door um, and and saying, hey, can you include me in the base model? Also, that kind of doesn't scale out well um, uh, in, in terms of having the the base model getting bigger and bigger. So what we really want to do is to make sure that you know, if you're consuming a base model, uh, uh, sorry, a, 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 a new get package rather, you get the right the right model for that package. But that requires all the things that Katie was talking about to be solved in order to uh, solve for that. We need your consent as a package owner to go train. We actually need something that you may or may not have, which is usage, right? Um, and, and we need sample um, uh, usage of your code. And that's because the, the model really only learns by, by spidering across usage, not uh, so much looking at the API itself, but looking at how people use that API and in all the different contexts that it's used. And it's most useful when all of the contexts are expressed in that learning data. So um, it's it's not as easy as it sounds, um, and it's a problem we really desperately want to crack. As Katie says, it's on our backlog, um, but um, we, we haven't got there yet. And I'm super interested to hear back, you know, if there's anybody who's got packages right now, what, what uh, it, I'm Katie and I would be love to be in touch with you about about what that feels like in terms of what would you or your ideal workflow be? How would that fit in with you? Would it be just like that you um, when you publish your NuGet package, the work of doing a training gets done automatically for you and somehow gets pushed up? And um, how, how do you see that playing out for you? Do, would that work well? Would there be something else that you would want? Please, you know, all of this stuff's only going to work if we can get all of the ecosystem people who are, who are actually playing the game uh, in on on how we're doing it. <laughs> yeah, so I guess the whole scaling thing makes uh, good sense. Of course, it wouldn't scale if 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 everybody's packages was was uh, in the base model. That makes total sense. So, and scaling is a hard problem to solve. I don't envy you to come up with a good design for that one. Yeah. Uh, well, fortu fortunately, Mads, the uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Fortunately, Mads, the, uh, the, the, there's an existing piece of scaling called NuGet, right, which basically lets us scale packages, right? So we're keen to follow the patterns that package managers give, uh, but we just want to layer ourselves up and on top of that as much as we can. That's how our minds are on this at the moment. And But if people want to kind of tweak our minds on it, we're more than happy to have discussions about that. <laughs> yeah, so uh, if you watch this live, please uh, give us a comment in the Q&A panel on your right side, or if you're watching this on demand on YouTube, uh, comments are below. Please, uh, please help us uh, get some insights here for uh, Mark and Katie. So, just to change gears a little bit, uh, you are uh, doing Intelli code, which is the originally was the augmentation of IntelliSense, and, and you know, but it's become more. 
like, and, and as I said in the beginning, every time I ask, what are you working on? It's always something new and different than what I thought it was going to be. So beyond completions, or that's what we internally call IntelliSense completion. Uh, what else do you have going on in your team right now? What are what, what else are you tinkering with, Mark? Wow. So, I mean, there's there's so much, <laughs> so, so much. Um, and, and we're, you know, the, when I look at the at the horizon of what the of what we're looking to do, we're trying we're really trying to um, you know help developers um, to you know I say beyond completion. Some of these things are actually just extending completions. Um, like so, for instance, um, you know we, we're doing some work um, to make completions even better in places where they're not to extend their scope. But we're also doing stuff, and Katie was kind of alluding to how how do developers learn? How do they understand? Um, there there are lots of steps. So. Um, there, there's a time, for instance, when you don't even know what API or, or, or even what library it is that you want to use. And typically right now you're going to be out on GitHub. Uh, it's not on GitHub, on uh, Stack Overflow or, or Bing or name your search engine of choice here. Um, <laughs> you're, you're going to be out there searching for solutions to different problems. How, but if your goal is a code snippet, yeah, why wouldn't that be inside VS? Um, uh, another one that we're looking at is looking at um, repeated patterns and, uh, you know, how we can help you with uh, with that. So when you're editing, um, I don't know if you've ever come across this scenario, you know, Mads, where you um, you introduce something new into your into your code, you're doing some refactoring somewhere, um, and, you know, you then have that really tedious task, maybe you've introduced a helper function of, of going ahead and uh, in, uh, introducing that in all the places that it applies um, in your project or maybe even in other projects. Um, and, and particularly if that helper function contains, you know, functionality that fixes a bug, you might even, if you forget to introduce that helper function somewhere, you might be having hidden bugs parked in your code somewhere uh, that, that, that you haven't fixed. Or maybe your team's developed a new pattern for doing something that helps avoid some trouble. Um, you know, maybe you've got a particular way of dealing with uh, certain threading constructs, or, you know, you've got a, a way of catching if blocks and the, a convention for the way you throw exceptions and blah, 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 blah. You know, teams have these things and they have them for a reason. They, they, they learn these things um, uh, by grazing their knees and by by actually doing stuff um, and, and having um, trouble hit them and then the team gets together and they figure out some solutions but the real trouble comes when they want um, uh, when you want when you want to make it basically codify that and make sure that you don't miss it or miss opportunities for it in other places and that's where the power of the machine comes in to help you out um, to, uh, to to help you figure out where those locations might be so if, if I can, I'd like to show a, a teeny tiny demo um, of, of, of how, how that might work. So uh, just start sharing your screen and I'll get yeah, it up. Just bear with me for a moment and I will share my Visual Studio. Let me know when you're seeing my screen. Yep. Awesome. Oh, hang cool. on. There we go. So um, I'm, I'm just uh, in the middle of Visual Studio right now. This is just a preview release, and uh, um, this is a feature that we call IntelliCode Suggestions. And so what's actually going to happen here is uh, I've got this crafty code here, uh, which does a Fahrenheit to Celsius conversion, and I'm just going to go ahead and replace it because I've got myself a helper function that actually does that for me. And now I've got to go through my whole program and find all the places where that might apply, and that's, you know, uh, not necessarily an easy task because, um, uh, you know, the variable names I use might be different. There's some slight changes of formatting. So a straight up find and replace might not do this. But what I find is you might have noticed as soon as I finished that second instance there, something has happened. OK, and over here I've got a new thing. OK, it says show IntelliCode suggestions based on repeated edits. It's been watching me as I go. OK, and we'll talk a little bit more about how that works in a moment. But it's been watching me as I go. And when I click on that thing there, I see that it's saying, OK, there's another one of those at line 124. I double click on it and here's another light bulb. And it suggests the exact fix that I need based on the pattern that I was typing. OK, so if I take that, sure enough, it's fixed it for me. OK, so you can see what's going on here. Um, I'll just stop sharing my screen now. Um, and uh, we can talk a little bit about how that works. Um, so the magic there underneath the hood um, was a thing called prose. Uh, now, prose is a little bit different from your uh, your standard um, machine learning and AI 
based things. So what, what Katie was talking about with the base completions and the team completions um, that, that we, we've, we've gotten into, those things are all based on a, a machine learning algorithm or an algorithm that works across a relatively large corpus of code and learns a bunch of patterns based on it sort of after the fact in fr frozen code, if you like, you know, that, that code is actually, you know, learned across at one moment in time. What you saw there was it was dynamically learning. OK, and what Prose was doing was it was tracking my AST, my abstract syntax tree deltas. OK, so it looks at my code and it says, OK, when Mark was typing that thing, this kind of change occurred and it was like it was a tree that looked like this and then it turned into a tree that looked like that. OK, so it was able to deal with the fact that the variable, for instance, the variable names were different and some of the constructs might be different because of that. OK, it looks at those deltas and once it finds some common ones, it tries to synthesize up a transform program that lets the uh, user get um, that fix that I was showing to you. So the thing that takes you from before to after, that's like a, a transformation program or a, a, a synthesized suggestion that is made by example by clustering. OK, those deltas in the ASTs as I go and having learned that rule, OK, then it can apply it anywhere in my code that I open up. Um, so that's pretty natty. I, I, I like it. I like it a lot um, because it, it actually um, is, is learning. We, we've talked about how it, it learns from the um, you know, the kind of wisdom of the broad community in terms of the the, um, the work that uh, we have in completions um, uh, and then about how we can learn from the wisdom of the, the narrower community on your team when we're talking about team completions. But now we're talking about learning from what you type, what individuals type, and then, you know, eventually we're thinking maybe we get that uh, that knowledge out to the team as well. Um, wouldn't that be cool if, if those rules that we found were something that were actually a transferable asset? Wouldn't that be a neat idea? Anywho, um, this this is something that's just it's a different kind of learning. So we're we're not hung up on the idea that everything we do has to be AI in the conventional sense of that word. That it has to be learning across large corpuses. That it has to be using big fat models and uh, or even slimline models. Uh, we will do anything to have the machine find a pattern for you and help you apply it at the right point of need. That's the that's the real key. And so. Um, that second piece that you saw there is is an example of how we're doing that with pros um, uh, with with IntelliCode suggestions and folks can if they want to try this out they can try this out in any of our recent previews so go download the 166 uh, preview bits right now and you can you can try this out just go to the IntelliCode preview box and turn it on um, it's uh, it's really easy to to try out and we'd love to hear the feedback on that but that's one of the things that we're playing with as a team is to um to try and expand the kinds of learning that we're willing to take on all right so you bring up a good point uh go try the latest visual studio uh preview which is 16.6 preview something and uh, <laughs> uh but intellicode also works for visual in visual studio code right yeah so how do so, Katie, how does people go get the Visual Studio Code one? And, it, and is there a benefit one over the other? Are they or are they the same? Um, uh, sure. Um, so the benefits of Visual Studio versus Visual Studio Code, honestly, I think it's a matter of preference. Um, so I think that there are a number of developers who are accustomed to using Visual Studio and in Visual Studio, um, right now, um, the feature that I mentioned previously, team completions, um, right now we've only actually enabled that for C Sharp and C++ within Visual Studio. Um, so if you're trying to, if you're deciding whether or not you want to try team completions, um, right now if you are on Visual Studio Code, we haven't actually expanded there yet. Um, it is on our roadmap and in our backlog, but um, for right now if you're a C Sharp or C++ developer and you'd like to have custom um, completions um, tailored to your code base, um, you would have to be on Visual Studio. However, uh, we do have uh, base completions, so getting those starred completion suggestions um, for um, JavaScript, TypeScript, um, uh, like uh, right now we have C++ and we also have, um, I'm probably blanking on Python, um, I'm probably blanking on a couple SQL. SQL, XAML. XAML. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I think that's about it. XAML, SQL, Python, JavaScript, TypeScript, um, C++. We have that available in Visual Studio Code. And the way to get that 
is you would actually have to go to the um, the Visual Studio Marketplace. Um, so like uh, the Co Visual Studio Code Marketplace, um, and you'd have to um, install that the IntelliCode extension. Um, and uh, you could also do that directly in Visual Studio Code. So um, the other thing I would say is that we also are preview feature um, that uh, you can actually um, try out in Visual Studio um, preview as like Mark suggested previously um, and as Matt sort of alluded to, um, you can try out all of our latest features, which we tend to um, not all, always focus on Visual Studio, but a lot of a lot of our, our previews have sort of started in Visual Studio, um, but you can go to Visual Studio and um, you can um, uh, access a number of our, our preview features there. Um, so yeah, so I don't know, know if there's a which one is better. I think it is a matter of developer preference and, and what you are accustomed to working in. Um, I do think that Visual Studio does offer um, uh, like a, a very um, um, more comprehensive experience. Um, and, and if you are, are familiar with setting up your developer um, toolkit there, tool set there, um, we just sort of augment that experience. All right, very cool. So <clears throat> when I see, Mark, what you just showed and other things that I've seen IntelliCode do, it's it's like, you know, it's close to magic. And, and you know, and I realize I also don't understand sort of ML and AI concepts uh, very deeply. And so uh, there's a saying by someone that if you don't understand it, it's indistinguishable from magic or something, right? Um, but what is what kind of reactions do you get out there for uh, for people using it or seeing it for the first time? What 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 do you hear, Mark? <laughs> well, I mean it's it's interesting. You know, um, it varies from um, shock and, and and the magic response to how on earth is it doing that to suspicion sometimes. Like like I'm not quite sure how it could do that or why it would do that. But um, you know, one of the things I think we're always trying to be in the IntelliCo team uh, is um, kind of humble about the uh, the technology that we're using. And um, you know, it's not always perfect because these things are um, you know based on algorithms that um, you know do not always produce perfect results with 100% certainty. Um, we always want to say that the things that we're producing are either a suggestion or something of that sort. And the reason why is because um, we, we don't want to uh, want people to think that this is like, it's not like static analysis. So if you think about the, um, uh, and even that can get it wrong, of course, as we've as if you've been around static analysis long enough, you can know there are false positives there. But um, if you think about the suggestions code that I just showed you, the, the amazing sort of ability to spot patterns, uh, does it get that right 100% all of the time? No, it does not. Um, uh, but what it does is when it does get it right, uh, when those suggestions are good, they essentially end up being something that can be almost like the analyzer you didn't have to write. OK, it's it's basically because um, no, not many people have taken the time to go and write a linter or an analyzer or something of that sort. Um, uh, but when we can actually do this right for you, um, we can really add value. And so we're on a delicate balance um, between trying to make sure that, uh, you know, we surface the, the suggestions that are useful to you. Um, so for instance, in that suggestions code, one of the things under the hood that's going on there that we learned quite early on is we really want to make sure that even um, uh, AST suggestion, uh, Delta suggestions uh, that we get um, that might be true in terms of the transforms you know they, they may actually be a correct observation but that which which increase the number of um, uh, errors in your code those things we don't currently suggest it may be that they're valid and it may be that in future we actually have a bit more control over that and say actually i'm perfectly happy to have my code to be in a broken state in an intermediate and, and you know that when you're editing sometimes that happens right that you're you have to go through broken to get to good um but um initially in terms of making this useful to people um we we felt that the, the sweet spot was that we need to make sure we don't um uh, cause suggestions that would make the code break now you know that's going to change over time but um you know in terms of reactions from people people generally don't react well to uh, suggestions that make their code break um uh, unless they know it's going to do that unless they know what the nature of the thing they're applying is so you know that's one of the things we've heard but um 
and, and that's part of what's gone into you know the suggestions uh, set up as it stands right now. Um, yeah, you know, but also that that notion of humility in terms of the suggestions that we make, I think you'll always find that. Um, so, for instance, um, if you think back to the IntelliSense example, um, IntelliSense will show you everything that's type valid for the location that you're you're typing. Okay, when you do a method or a property or a, an argument, those things, if if they're valid code, then IntelliSense will show them to you. But this is in the pre IntelliCode IntelliSense, right? It will show them. All we're doing is kind of sprinkling some, some some recommendation sugar, some suggestion sugar on top of that, right? Um, and making it say, okay, but we think, given your context, you might want to do that. Um, and, and notice I'm using think and might there. We're not saying you'll definitely want to do that. We're saying you might want to do that. So it, it's very important with these AI assisted tools that we we, we make sure we understand that um, and, and, and that we express that in the kind of experiences that we surface. Um, so I, I would say that's that's been true across everything that we've done so far and I anticipate it probably stays that way. Yeah. So it's not like a moment in time um, like the AI technology has just not evolved enough to be more that we can be more uh, prescriptive saying this is what you want to do. So right now we're just saying, oh, maybe this is what you want to do and we suggest something. But is that just because technology hasn't caught up or? I don't know. I don't know that that's actually ever going to completely go away, Matt, because th there's such a broad spectrum of things that are possible to express. Um, you know, we get more precise and more confident, and we, we spend a, a lot of time obsessing about precision and coverage, um, which are two key metrics that we, we measure all the time. Uh, and, and really, precision is about how often we get it right, and coverage is about how many places we can get it right. Um, and uh, so the um, uh, those things are things we bothered we are de deeply bothered about. We want to drive that number higher um, uh, so that we get we cover more stuff and we cover it at a higher precision. That's always goodness. But getting to 100% is not necessarily our goal. Um, being useful is our goal, right? Uh, being being useful uh, to the developer and helping them to um, you know move forward faster. Uh, that those are those are the goals that we care most about. Mm -hmm. Right. That uh, that reminds me of like uh, um, it's it's sort of a, a mantra that we have here in my family is like never let perfect get in the way of good, right? Yeah. Because there's so much good to be had, and it doesn't have to be perfect to add a tremendous amount of value. Yeah. Um. So, I've heard like some people be a little bit concerned about AI, right? Like, is it going to take my job? Like. Where are we in, you know, with the AI and machine learning inside Visual Studio? Like, are we getting closer to being able to automate uh, development as a whole, as a discipline, maybe? Uh, what, what, what are the sort of concerns that you hear from people, and and what are your answers to them, Katie? Uh, so, I'd love to talk with Mark about this too, because I know Mark and I talk about this a lot. Um, but from my perspective. Um, we are so far away from that um, as a discipline. Um, and I think that as Mark was highlighting um, in his previous um, comment, um, I think that like we're really, the, the goal of what we're trying to do and embedding or integrating AI um, and machine learning um, techniques um, into Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, our main goal is to promote common usage uh, um, and sort of promote those those common practices, best practices. And um, we're at the point, I think, um, in the in the juncture, in the grand scheme of things, I think we're very, very nascent. Um, and we're at the point where um, what we're doing is um, providing just helpful contextual examples. Um, so that's what the com what completions does. Um, that's what suggestions, as you saw Mark um, demo previously, um, that is what that is doing. It's providing suggestions that really just sort of like help you remain in the dev environment and, and help you sort of like keep in that flow, that developer flow and not get distracted by going to, you know, the web and like searching this and then seeing those shoes that you've been wanting to purchase or seeing that, you know, $10 USB speaker that you're like, I want to get that. Um, it helps you sort of keep focus on the task at hand. Um, and, and I think we're just, we're, we're really far away from automating people's like dev jobs away, developer jobs away. And I don't even think that that is a, a goal that we ever actually intend to, to, to reach. Our goal has been mainly just like, how do we 
enable developers who already are sort of like a very valuable resource. Um, how do we keep them um, to just uh, uh, keep them focused on on whatever their task is? How do we enable them to be as productive as they possibly can and not productive for, you know, you know, the, the, the man or like the business, but being productive for their own selves? Like, how do we actually provide them with the tools that as they're learning development and onboarding to coding that they're actually able to see this as a, like this is actually a fun task? Um, there's some sort of like ludic engagement aspect to like just actually just development. Mm -hmm. um, so I think from our perspective, that's sort of our spin. But I'd love to like have this conversation with Mark as well. So I know Mark has, you know, is is you know very much like on the edge of his seat to answer his question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mark, let's hear it. Oh man, yeah. I mean, th this is this is the heart of what where my head's been for the last couple of years. You know that um, this is not at all about taking away people's jobs. And, and and as Katie says, I mean, even technologically, we are far from that, but it's just not what we're about. Um, we are about enhancing the experience of development, about making development, um, yeah, I mean, I dare to say fun, right? Um, to, to actually make it um, less painful and less difficult to stay in the zone, to stay in the, that. I love the word ludic. One of my great heroes was Bill Hill, by the way, who sadly passed away. Um, and uh, but that notion of ludic engagement in coding, that that notion of being, um, you know, I'm locked into this space. I'm thinking about stuff. I don't have to be distracted away to some other place uh, in order to go and figure out what I'm doing. Um, I can stay in the zone and the tool just helpfully augments me, right? Helpfully augments me in the, at the right moment um, with the knowledge that I couldn't otherwise get. It's, it's giving me superpowers, basically. It's giving, giving me superpowers by saying, I can now as a developer know, for instance, all the patterns um, that I have um, out there that my team has uh, has developed. So I don't have to worry about tripping over that banana skin whilst I'm in the process of figuring out how to, how to implement this great piece of technology that I'm actually implementing. My head's about the technology. It's not worrying about those other things that I might be missing. Or, you know, let's imagine, I, I, and, and I know, you know, maybe I'm just getting old a little bit, but um, here's the thing, um, we, know a lot of APIs, but we sure as heck forget a lot of APIs as well. Right? Um, so I don't want to have to be going back to the documentation to reboot myself into the zone when I hit that piece of code that I haven't touched in three years, right? I want to be able to know what the common usage is right now so that I'm not, you know, losing my context, losing my vibe. Um, Really, we want to make development more pleasurable. We want to give developers superpowers. We want to give them that capacity to get more done, uh, not just because it's it's kind of good for business, but because it's good for the soul. <laughs> you know? Anyway, I, Katie, Katie, I'm sure you want to come back on that, hey? Um, sure, Mike. Yeah, or Mark. Yeah, I I really wanted to actually like sort of segue this into um, something that. Um, and Telecode provides. Um, so an example of how we're actually trying to make development more more helpful and also more pleasurable, as Mark was mentioning, is that we're trying to like reduce the arguments that are had over very like, you know, uh, sometimes you'd think like trivial things. Like, um, for example, um, your code styles. That happens all the time or formatting. So. Do we have the tab or do we have like two spaces or like three spaces or four spaces and and things like that um, are often just like fights or, or not necessarily fights, but conversations that go on for way too long that actually distract from your ability or de or detract from your ability to actually just code. Um, so how do we actually solve that? Um, so I'm actually going to uh, share my screen and show you um, an example of how we're actually trying to aid developers and development teams from having these sort of back and forth arguments about code styles and, and code formatting. Okay, so as you can see my screen, um, I've loaded a solution um, and, and the feature that I'm actually going to demo is a feature called inferred editor config. So if you're familiar with editor config files, an editor config file is a cross-platform file um, and, and there is a, a common syntax, uh, defined syntax that sort of defines sort of the code styles and code formatting um, conventions um, that exist within a solution or project. 
Um, so typically what developers would do is they would write an editor config file. But what happens if you're in a team and you don't actually know, like you, you just sort of, you have this project, you don't actually know what the styles are actually already exist there, um, but you, you have sort of like some people have opinions. Um, how about you start from uh, instead of having opinions, why not start from an analyzed um, uh, like an anal like an analysis of your current code base and the current code conventions and the current code styles that exist there, and then from there. Um, like determine what it should be and have those uh, very meaningful, like bring the data to the to the conversation or the debate. Um, so, so what you can do is you can actually add a new editor config file that IntelliCode, what IntelliCode will do in the background is it's actually analyzing that solution and it has now generated an editor config file. So instead of having to go and define all of these rules, um, Ed, uh, IntelliCode has actually just defined this for you. Um, so if you if you see, this is what um, IntelliCode has produced in the .editor config file. Um, so I've already opened up a file. Um, it's called Paint Object Constructor. And something that you'll notice is that you'll notice here that it's suggesting me. Um, I've already sort of like loaded up the line. I'm sorry. Um, but it's, it's suggesting that I actually take an action and actually make a fix. And that is based off of uh, the defined um, uh, coding conventions and um, uh, that have been defined in the editor config file that IntelliCode has already generated for me on my, be on, on my, my behalf. And so because this lives in the solution, so you'll see the editor config file here, um, once I commit this, um, this will automatically be shared with the rest of my team. And so um, as you can tell, I could actually introduce this, but um, I, I can actually uh, take action on this suggestion. Um, but I, I also want to just show you that what is the actual rule that is, that is, that is providing me with uh, this, um, this suggestion. And if you'll notice, if, you can go, if I can go down there, there is a rule that says that um, you prefer methods to be practiced with this. And, and so I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, the scenario that is this would be very, very impactful for and useful for is a scenario when um, I'm, I'm in a team and um, we just have had a lot of conversations back and forth about what should be the, the common style or the common coding practices for my team. Um, and often they just, uh, people are bringing their opinions to the conversation and um, based off of their own history. But why don't we take the code as the main artifact? And we say, here's how, um, here is how after I've analyzed our code base, these are the styles that already exist within my code base or within the solution or within this project. And from there, then bring this to the conversation and say, IntelliCode has generated this editor config file that is as uh, based off of what exists, uh, the styles that exist in my my code base, uh, in our code base. Let's actually see if like, do we actually want our 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 code base to um, our code to look this way, or do we want to have um, do we want to change it in a different way? So this it actually it, it not only promotes just sort of common or the best uh, or the, the common or the historical uh, code st code styles, but also gives you sort of like that starter. Um, for that conversation and, and also um, reduces that time that you're going back and forth about debates. You can just say, this is what the codes, this is what um, sort of exists commonly in our, in our code. Um, do we want it to exist differently? Do we want it to be different? And the cool part about it is once you've actually have this defined editor config, um, uh, if it's a C sharp in this case, the Roslyn analyzer will start providing you with warnings and pushing suggestions for you to change. That is pretty cool. Okay, so IntelliCode does editor config formatting as well. So it's really a broad set of features that your team is doing. So is it fair to say that IntelliCode is is not a feature? It is more like a team that work on certain type of problems, Mark? 
Yeah, that's absolutely right, Matt. We, uh, we work on the, the set of problems where we believe we can bring this kind of pattern understanding to bear to give you good, useful productivity features that augment your developer workflow, right? So we're all about that. So we're, in a sense, we're a set of AI-assisted development tools that we're trying to apply across a broad spectrum, whether that's in VS or in VS Code, whether it's to do with things that are happening at edit time, whether it's to do with things that are happening, even as Katie was just showing, you know, that art editor config artifact can play out at CI build time as well. So, you know, we don't really mind where we add the value um, as long as it's helpful to developers and helping them to accelerate. But our, our core thing is to um, distill down the pattern wisdom and bring it to you to you at the point of need, right? So that's that's our, our our motto, if you like, to to try and get things done that way. Yeah. So we're not just one thing. We're not just about IntelliSense. We're about any time we can provide you with helpful insights um, based based on patterns. Um, that's yeah. that's the deal. Okay. So so you you were mentioning this, but you said that the like you're basically doing a lot of work up front, and then you present it to the Visual Studio user as they need it. Does that mean that the overhead of running the machine learning and AI engine doesn't happen in real time on the developer machine's CPU and take away performance for the Visual Studio? <laughs> it has already happened before, or how, how does that how That, that is an awesome question. And in fact, the answer is complicated. <laughs> 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 um, so in, in some cases, the answer to your question is yes. We, we, we uh, offload. For instance, in creating those machine learning models, and uh, one really exciting development that, that we should talk about actually is that uh, we, we've been doing some in enhancement of the um, the completions model with, with with deep learning. Those things are high horsepower activities, right? That we want to we want to make sure that we keep those things on the uh, on our servers so it doesn't gum up your machine, right? We would we don't want you to be having to uh, run learning locally if you if you don't have to. Um, but sometimes we we do a little bit of work on your local machine it really we're trying to optimize that uh, as much as possible and the and the training um, where it's necessary to do training uh, happens on on remote machines where the big horsepower lives or we keep the training process or the the algorithm to a to a point where it can learn very very efficiently so you saw when i was doing the suggestions work that uh, you know when i was typing away there there was analysis going on you know as i was typing as it turns out that that algorithm is running locally on the user's box um, and and we've done a lot of work to make sure that, that 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 actually remains highly efficient in terms of memory usage and cpu usage so that we don't swamp you and don't uh, take away from your your uh, editing uh, smoothness right we don't want to be doing that we don't want to be flattening your battery we don't want to be doing any of that kind of thing particularly in these days when we're working remotely more you know you've got to be laptop friendly right and uh, the, the reality is that um, you know it's horses for courses as we say in england right we, we you basically you pick the right um, the right tool for the right job and and um, so when we are doing things that are extremely complex um, uh, and when we need to do things like you know deep learning models and so forth, chances are you're going to find us doing that on a server somewhere on your behalf so we don't eat your machine CPU and battery. Uh, where it's appropriate, um, uh, we will sometimes do uh, local work as well, but we will always work hard to make sure that that's not uh, something that's um, uh, going to impact you too badly. Um, so kind of not a simple answer, but um, you know, hopefully it makes sense. <laughs> Yes, thank you so much. Uh, it totally does, and uh, it's wonderful that we can get great AI capabilities without uh, using using our battery um, on our laptops here. So, okay, we are almost at the end, and I want to just uh, um, end this with uh, a quick question to both of you. So let's start with uh, Katie. Katie, what is it that excites you the most for uh, the future of IntelliCode that you're going to work on in the foreseeable future? Oh, we've lost her. She's muted. Uh, that's such a great question, um, uh, Mads. Uh, yeah, and that's such a large question. Um, what most excites me? Um, so I have mainly been focused on the completion space. And so for me, um, there's a number of uh, goodies that are up our sleeves that um, I will wait to present on those um, or talk about them to in, in depth. But I will say that I'm very excited about um, working really closely with some um, some early uh, customers um, who are just interested in, in dog booting and preview. Um, 
and just like learning from them um, about these upcoming experiences that we're, we're working on. So I'm being very coy and, and not being very uh, uh, forthright about what we're working on, but I will tell you that it's um, really, really exciting and um, in the completion space. And I'm looking forward to just learning and, and hearing from our customers um, about the, these new experiences, um, because I think that um, they will really sort of uh, take what we're, yeah. So I think that it will be great, yeah. Awesome. Uh, and Mark, same question for you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, customer customer input is super vital to us, and, and I'm really interested to hear other places where people have tedious tasks that they would like us to take out of their way. Uh, but I'm personally, you know, uh, you know, very excited about the ways we're going to be able to spread out the knowledge um, uh, that, that's in your team um, and, and get that out to everyone in your team so they can take advantage of it. I think that's that's going to make a, a huge difference to people uh, as they go forward. Um, and uh, we've definitely got some good things you know coming in that domain and, and also new ways for developers to express their intent in a more compact way. So, you know, whether that's by um, uh, you know, typing something once and getting us to do something again, or or whether there are just other ways to say what they want the machine to do for them. Um, I think there's lots to be done in that space. And uh, watch this space. Uh, we have lots to say at Build, so uh, come along and watch our talk there as well. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, both uh, Katie and Mark, for uh, for joining me here today. I hope uh, the viewers out there had a, a good time and learned something new. I sure did. So, um, so thank you so much. Uh, we're at the other line. It is, uh, it's been an hour and um, I hope I'll see you again next week, Thursday morning at 9 a.m. Pacific time, where we will talk about uh, the UX lab that we have here in, uh, in Microsoft that we use in Visual Studio to uh, interview customers and see how they do eye tracking and, and learn a bunch of cool things and how we apply that and what are some of the learnings we have from that? When doesn't it work and when does it work really well? And I think there's something in that that you can apply as well uh, at home. So make sure to tune in next week. Thank you so much.